Okay, so we are live. Uh, welcome everyone to, to VDF CPR webinar. Today we're very happy to have Rohini Pande from Yale University, uh, who will be presenting her work uh, on investing in the next generation, the long run educational impacts of a liquidity shock. Uh, so before I leave the floor to Rohini, let me give you a little bit of, um, of the ground rules for today's talk although many of the frequent attendants uh, already know them. Um, the seminar will run for one hour. At the end of the talk, we're gonna have 15 minutes for a live Q&A. So towards the end, if you have a question that you, you would ask, like to ask live to Rohini, just raise your hand and I'll open up the, the mic uh, for you to ask uh, uh, your question live. Um, during the seminar, we'll make a couple of pauses in which I will transmit uh, to Rohini uh, your questions. So please write them down in the Q&A section. Uh, Patrick uh, here, one of the co-authors of the paper is going to be answering some of the questions and, and the others um, I, I will transmit uh, to Rohini. Um, Please, if we don't transmit your, your questions to the speaker live, don't be offended. This is not because your questions are bad, but just there's a limited amount of time. And also uh, we've taken a peek at the slides. So some of your questions might come later during, during the talk. So I will omit those. Uh, we would like to crowdsource the, the good questions. So please help us out by putting thumbs up on the questions that you think are, are relevant. Um, needless to say, aggressive or abusive behavior will not be tolerated in this space. Uh, we have enough of that stuff outside right now. Uh, so, okay, without further ado, uh, Rohini, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for agreeing to talk in this seminar. Yeah. Thank you very much for inviting me. And once again, thank you all of you for starting and conducting this uh, seminar series. I think it's a great way for many of us to come together while we can't meet so easily. So what I want to talk today is um, called Investing in the Next Generation, the Long Run Educational Impacts of a Liquidity Shock. And it's joined with Patrick, who is uh, here and will be answering some of the questions. Also, Ariel Bernhard, who's a graduate student at Harvard. Uh, my long-term uh, co-author on this project, Erica Field at Duke and Natalia Rigol at Harvard Business School. So the starting point of this paper in terms of thinking really big picture is that, you know, as poverty has gone down, one has got increasingly concerned about what we think of as points of chronic poverty. So these are very often associated with intergenerational persistence. So we see poverty increasingly clustered in certain households or certain communities and continuing on across generations. And one way that we see this continuing on is a lack of human capital investment in uh, relatively poor households. Um, and this includes, um, and this includes uh, the, cor the correlation of parent-child education being relatively high in uh, the developing world. So for instance, in India at 0 0.52 um, versus 0 0.042. So it sounds like you can't see something. Yes, the slides. <laughs> okay, so my slides are up. Maybe I need to share the screen again. I, I think I, sh I assume it was shared again, sorry. Um, but I think when Mandy put up the CPR, it got unshared. How's that? Yes, perfect. Okay, great. Okay, so I don't think you missed anything very important to now, so I won't go back. Um, so how do we think about sort of breaking this um, cycle of poverty? So this quote of vicious cycle of poverty actually comes from Santiago Levy, um, the founder of Progressa and Oportunidades. And there one often the thought is that you should condition transfers to adults on them ensuring that their children go to school or uh, get health uh, investments. One assumption underlying such choices is that parents' investment in education is not socially optimal. And so you need the state to come in and condition these transfers on behavior. But in reality, we actually don't have a lot of evidence on whether that's the case. So the evidence that we have on the intergenerational impacts of asset or cash transfers that target adults is relatively low. Uh, but I think right now, you know, many of us are getting older and a lot of, I'd say, first generation experimental evaluations of these transfer programs 
are now beginning to reach the stage where we can start looking at whether we see intergenerational impacts. And so the, what this paper is concerned with is really asking is when you have this, if you have an adult targeted uh, program that yields household level economic gains, do we see that actually translating into investments in the next generation's human capital? Now, whether this happens is going to depend on multiple factors. Uh, it's going to depend on what the size of the grant or the economic gains from the program are relative to the liquidity constraints that the household is facing, if that's what's limiting its human capital investments. It's going to depend on what the investor opportunities are if you're in a rural area with schools and health clinics very far away and poorly, um, poorly attended, it may be it may be the liquidity is not the binding constraint. And finally, and I think this is what underlay lies a lot of CCTs, is this idea that the parents' preferences may not be aligned with those of the ch child's when it comes to investments in education, and or they may lack uh, correct information on the returns to education. So what we're going to do here is we're going to be building off a flexible microcredit finance contract experiment that we conducted in 2007 in an urban area in India, in Calcutta. Over half of the households at the time of our intervention in the sample had at least one school going child. So it's a reasonable sample to be thinking about in terms of educational investments. It's also in, in the first paper we wrote on, on this intervention, we showed that three years later, there were significant gains in household incomes. These were households that saw a 20% increase in income. So what I'm going to talk about today is um, kind of results we see from two rounds of additional data collection, one which we took uh, five years after and one 11 years after. And for the educational investment part, we're really going to focus on this 11 year uh, follow up where we measured household income and educational outcomes for all children who were ever born to that household. So since I'm sure I'm going to run out of time, let me just preview three of the main sets of results. So first we find that in this sample, the income gains from the flexible contract persist up to a decade later. We see an 8% increase in the high monthly income on a base of um, over $600 uh, for a household of four. So think of this as a household that roughly has $5 per day per, uh, per person. We see significant gains in education. So uh, on, a, on the main thing that we focus on is college enrollment for reasons that I'll argue is the relevant margin right now in a lot of urban settings. And we see a 34% gain in that. But the last part, which I think is relevant in terms of um, policy, is we also find evidence that these investment gains are concentrated among uh, more educated parents. So more educated parents are the ones who translate their, their income gains into educational investments. And so one implication of this is that while we see overall gains in education, we also see an increase in the next generation's educational inequality, suggesting that there may well still remain a case for other, other programs, especially for the lower educational end of the distribution. So let me start by just giving a very uh, quick review of some of the related literature. I should also add up here that this is the first time I think we're presenting it really to an audience. So um, all comments, including um, references that we missed out on would be very welcome. So what do we know about raising human capital across generations? So I'd say for the developing world, much of the evidence right now comes from rural areas. So we have a body of quasi-experimental evidence that really points to the fact that the trade-off that you're going to see is if you have a positive income shock, households are richer, and so they can, they can invest in their child's education. But at the same time, very often what's making them richer is higher productivity. And so there is an alternative use for uh, children, um, which is as uh, workers in agriculture and a household enterprise. And so as a result, the net effect can vary quite a lot from context to context. And Zimmerman, in fact, argues that in the case of India, this is something that has even changed over time. We see a similar trade-off from the one study that exists for microfinance. Turning to experimental evidence, there are two studies that have cash transfers targeted directly to adolescent children. And what these find is relatively mixed evidence. Um, where we have, as I said, limited evidence is on whether cash transfers to adults can impact the children's outcomes. So let me talk about two sets of evidence here, which is not at all meant to be uh, 
exhaustive, but gives you a sense of literature. So let me start with some of the microfinance experimental studies, since that's really the kind of intervention closest related to us. Um, so these are the six papers that featured in the AEJ special edition on microfinance. And I think across the board, what they reported was uh, insignificant gains on average income. So given that incomes didn't change, it's perhaps unsurprising that you don't see changes in education spending on average. Although what is interesting is that in two of these studies, you find effects on school attendance, which go in opposite directions. And so to the extent that, as I said, all of them saw increases in business outcomes, this could be consistent with the effects being ambiguous to ex-ante. More relevant for us perhaps are the kind of asset transfer uh, programs that we see because most of these have tended to report income gains in the medium run. So these are four studies in Uganda, the Blackman et al. study that provided a youth grant in Sri Lanka business grants, and then two ultra poor studies in Bangladesh and India. Um, there are many other ultra poor studies as well, but these two are in some ways the closest. One is in West Bengal, which is the same state as we were working in, and one was in Bangladesh. And what you see here is overall gains in income, but these studies have tended not to yet uh, report on educational outcomes. Uh, but certainly the kind of, kind of results that we find, we'd be very interested to see whether we see similar effects on these grant programs. With the, caveat, the one caveat though, that these are occurring in rural areas, where as I said, school access may be, um, or higher education access may be harder to achieve. So let me now turn on that note to the context of what we, uh, where we are. So I want to start by just giving you some context on the educational trends in India. So what this graph is, this is from the uh, most recent DHS survey for India, 2015-16. And we've basically taken um, all the individuals we see in it and ranked them by their birth year plus 18. So this is the year at which they would be college eligible. The light shaded area is the birth years that on average correspond to the adults in our sample. And the brown is the children who we're tracking. So this just gives you the sense of the context. So if you look at the brown part of the line, what you see here is that primary schooling, especially for urban boys, is becoming close to, into, uh, close to universal at this point in time. Um, it's lower for the rural population, but there's a very steep rise. And I'd say since then, um, the general sense is that primary schooling in India has reached uh, mostly universal status. Of course, now with COVID, we'll see uh, how much of that gets reversed. Where you do see um, less gains is in secondary schooling. So on average, around 40% of the individuals uh, who would correspond to the kids in our sample are in a secondary school in, uh, in the urban areas. But here, I think the one point thing I would highlight is the complete closing of the gender gap. And we see a similar closing of the gender gap when we look at um, uh, college going. So again, college going is lower, um, but again, we see that the gender gap is completely closed. A second context fact that's relevant is, uh, and many people have written about this, um, across South Asia, there's been a humongous rise in private education. So parents are increasingly choosing between government schools and a very rapidly expanding private sector. At the same time, we also see that the rates of return uh, are increasing with years of education and the relatively high rates of return for both men and women from uh, secondary and college education. These rate of returns tend to be higher in urban areas where we see a larger reliance often on uh, private sector uh, schooling opportunities. And again, to give you a sense of our context, roughly 92% of the sample children aged seven to 17 at baseline report um, after school tutoring during secondary school. And this average spending on this tutoring is expensive. It's 64% higher than total school costs. So you can see that this is a setting where there are potentially liquidity constraints binding, but these are binding in terms of accessing the private sector and additional after school tutoring. So let me stop here for a second to see if there are any uh, questions I should take, Gianmarco. Uh, there's been a few clarification questions that I think that Pat Patrick has um, resolved. So, so we can just go ahead. Okay, great. Thanks, Patrick. Okay, so now let me turn to uh, tell you about what we did in 2007 and how we followed up since. 
So in 2007, we partnered with a microfinance institution, uh, Village Financial Services. Um, this is an urban MFI in Calcutta. And like most MFIs, it would form uh, groups of women, but each woman would be given an individual loan, roughly between 4,000 to 10,000 rupees. Um, the sample we drew was the typical sample. Um, they were largely um, uh, first-time borrowers, but they were from households which had at least one household enterprise. And in a majority of the households, we see that women are actually uh, working, uh, working businesses. So what was the intervention that we undertook in 2007? So after the loan groups were formed, uh, we randomized loan groups into whether they continued on with the standard contract. So the standard contract was you get the loan, you have two weeks, and then after two weeks, you start repaying a fixed amount every two weeks for a total of, um, I think it was uh, 42 weeks. What we did in the treatment group is that you received a two month grace period. So you got this, so your, your loan amount had been fixed already. Your loan group and your loan amount had been fixed before you were randomized into treatment or control. But if you were in treatment, you were told your first payment is going to be due uh, two months later. It would be a slightly higher payment, but it would go, sorry, it would be the same payment, it would go for additional weeks, um, but it would in both cases finish within a year. And in the first paper that we wrote, we showed that there was a small income effect created by this delay of two months, but I can't explain the size of the household income effect we find. And so in our original paper, we did quite a lot of work to show that the main effect we see from the grace period intervention is differences in how uh, people made business investments. And this then translated into differences in outcomes. So as I mentioned, sort of our households are roughly at $5 a day. So they're not the extreme poor, uh, but you know, they're not yet what we would think of as middle class. Uh, at the baseline, our median client was 33 and 89% had completed their fertility and had two children. So relatively low educated population, so rough, less than 1% of the households had someone who had attended any college, but at least 85, roughly 85% 85 had one household member who had some secondary schooling. And that's what we're going to think about as a high education sample. So this is what our data collection exercise looks like. So in 2007, at the time at which we um, implemented our intervention, we collected a household roster, but that was a household roster of everyone who lived in the house at that time, and kind of basic spending, which includes education spending. When the intervention ended in 2008, we collected data on how they used their loan, and also that included overall spending, including education spending. In 2010, which is the some survey that entered our uh, first paper, we conducted a business survey. So at this point, we actually didn't collect educational uh, expenditure data. We collected household income and business outcomes uh, by enterprise. So in this study, we're going to look at two additional waves, one in 2012, so that's five years after the loan, and then one in 2018, which is 11 years after the loan. In both of these, we starting 2010, we have the same consistent household income question that we're going to use uh, to look at income effects. Um, we also, in 2012 and 18, asked the education question, educational spending. And importantly, in 2018, we got a full child roster of all children ever born to the client, uh, irrespective of whether or not they lived in the household. And then for each of these children, we got very detailed educational information. So for each child, we filled an educational roster that looked at the, the spending at each level. And that's what we're going to look. So we're going to conduct our income analysis at the household level. But then for education, we're able to go down to a child level analysis. Our um, we see uh, attrition over time, but we have relatively good response rates up to 2018 at 86%. And uh, we don't see any difference in attrition by treatment status. Rohini, so uh, is, a, couple, yeah. a couple of questions of clarification that may be worth yeah, picking up now. The, the first one, um, the, the four to 10,000 rupees uh, of the loan relative to income is uh, more or less how much? Um, that's a, just for a context. Yeah, just for a context, I think that would be, uh, Patrick and jumping on, I think that would be around 20% of income, I'd say. 
Okay. And the, and the second question is about the treatment. So the two months grace period just means that you move the, the payment schedule two months ahead, but the, the repayment uh, frequency, interest rates, and so on are common to, is the same, right? Exactly. So that's why I was saying what it does mean that the grace period includes with it an income effect, because in effect, you know, you're paying, you're paying over a longer time period. So therefore you're paying, you, you get a bit of an income effect. And as I said in our first paper, we did quite a lot of work to show that that could not explain the size of the effects we see. That strictly we did two things. We both had a grace period and the people who got a grace period, in effect, got a slightly larger loan size, if you want. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, great. So um, what this um, slide shows you is just summarizes the results that we had in our first paper, where you see significant increases, the orange is the grace period on um, income, and these, are trans these show up as changes in both profits and also capital. Uh, in a, in a follow-up paper, we looked at um, fungibility of resources within the household, and I think this is somewhat relevant for what we're going to do now, is what we saw that households, you know, used investments where they saw the highest return in terms of which enterprise. So it wasn't that if a woman in, uh, got the loan, she only spent it on her, um, her enterprise, she may spend it on her husband's. At the same time, and I'll come back to this later, only 3%, um, only clients reported on average using only 3% of their loan for um, education directly. So let me now turn to talking about the first set of results, which is what were our long run impacts on income. So as I said, after three years, um, we saw a significant rise. How did this persist or not persist over time? So what we're going to do here is the survey question is a very simple question. It's a, it's a monthly income uh, asked exactly the same way across time. During the past 30 days, how much total income did your household earn? We're going to pool our sample and then, uh, and then look to see whether the treatment effect varied across survey waves. Um, and this specification is basically aimed to follow what is a common standard practice in long run follow up surveys of experiments. So when we run the pool uh, regression, we find a pool estimate of a household income rise of 13.4%, which is significant. On the left hand side, what I show you is the point estimate round by round for 2010, 12 and 18. As you can see by 2018, our estimate both becomes smaller and is noisier but we can't actually reject that it is the same as that in 2012. And so we see a declining effect size, but, can't, but overall the average effect is roughly an increase of 13% of household income over 11 years. So against that background, let me now turn to uh, next generation uh, results. Uh, Jarno, if, uh, any questions or? No, we're good. Okay, great. Okay. Uh, um, there's someone asking about heterogeneous effects, but that will come later. Yeah, great. So um, the first thing I want, uh, is that when we're going to look at the next generation effects, as I said, we're going to move towards looking in a child sample. So the first thing that's important to ask is, did the treatment lead to any effects in either fertility or child mortality? And we see no significant effects on either fertility or child mortality. As a reminder, uh, roughly 90% of our sample have completed fertility at the time of the intervention. So what we're going to do, and I'm going to show you a graph after this slide to uh, make it clearer as well, is we basically think about the age our the children are at the time of the intervention. And the basic, uh, basic idea we have is if the child was 18 or above, then the, intervention, the treatment itself had basically no ability to move their educational choices up to the choice of entering college. They had already made that choice. So for us, children 18 and above are going to enter as the placebo sample. The sample of children 7 to 17, which is roughly 40% of our sample, they're young enough that they're going to have their educational choices of whether they go to secondary school and whether they choose to enter college being affected by the treatment. Um, and they're old enough that they're going to be able to see their college entry choice. And so 51% of our households have at least one child in this group. I talked about a placebo sample. And then we have this third sample, which um, we're actually still incorporating, so I won't be talking about it today, is a partial education sample. So these are kids who are six or under at the time of the intervention. And so they're still going through education, but they haven't actually reached their college entry decision uh, point. And so they're still too young for college. 
There's no significant difference in which of the three groups you belong to as a child, depending on treatment status. So let me just show this graphically because I think it's kind of important to see this distribution. So this is the distribution in our control sample of kids at baseline. So you can see there's, there's some density of kids who are quite old. And then there's some density of those who are born after baseline. And otherwise it's quite, uh, I'd say uniformly distributed. And if you cut the other two by year, then probably more locals uniformly distributed. So the green lines now depict um, the educational status in 2018 at the time of our very long run survey. Um, these are all still in secondary school. So you can see that if you were one year old at baseline, roughly all of you are still in secondary school. Um, you, see a start, you see this begin to fall at the age of seven and essentially becomes uh, minimal after that. And what happens is that you start seeing at this age, you're transitioning to college. So you see the rise in the kids going to college. And so this is really how we're dividing our sample. And I should say that we've done robustness checks of kind of one year on either side, because as you can see at the cut point, especially at seven, you know, you could use seven, you could use eight, and it doesn't make a difference to our main results, which one we use. So I think a reasonable question to ask at this point is, you know, what had we specified where, you know, what were we expecting before we turned to the analysis? So we very much went into our 2018 survey being interested in education because we'd seen these increases in education expenditure in 2012. So we, we submitted a separate pre-analysis plan for the child level analysis. We pre-specified pre that we would look at fertility, mortality, and education outcomes. And we pre-specified two types of heterogeneity analysis, uh, child, gender, and parental education. What we didn't do in our, um, pre, uh, in our analysis plan is specify kind of the age cutoffs of which are the children that we think would be affected, which would be the placebo group. Uh, we did this after we got the full child roster in 2018, so we could see the full distribution and how educational choices varied. And as I said, we conduct some robustness checks on the age cutoffs that we use. So let me now turn to what we actually see in the, in the results. So let me first start with um, a household level analysis, which is what do we see in terms of household expenditures? So uh, we start on the left with the graph that looks at educational expenditure. So the question being asked to households was, you know, how much did you spend on education in the past 30 days? And what you see here is that in 2007, which is baseline, and 2008, which is exactly the point at which um, the loan cycle ended, there is no difference between educational spending across the control and the treatment group. They lie on top of each other. But starting 2008, we, st we, st we see educational spending increases more in the, in the treatment group. It's uh, strongly significant in 2012 and then becomes much noisier in 2018. And we look a little bit at how that varies by heterogeneity. We also see paralleling that uh, in medical expenditures, which is on the right, no difference in 2007 and 2008, a jump up in 2012, which was five years after the intervention, and then uh, smaller and noisier estimates on medical expenditure 11 years later. So here what we do is we now show these, and I'm showing just for brevity, um, pooling across rounds, these effects divided by the three groups that we care about. So if you want the kind of black dot is for the full sample. So if you look at educational expenditure, it's just telling you if you pool over time, you can see that it's sort of positive but noisy. Um, the, the red sample is yeah, kids who are too young, the green is at the placebo, and the, the, the third one is the one that we care about the most, which is the ones who had some kids in school. And what you see is that for that group, we see sign, on average significant increases in educational expenditure. What's interesting is when you compare this to the medical expenditures, recall that on average, we saw increases in medical expenditure as well in 2012. However, we don't see a comparable cut depending on um, the distribution of kids in that household. Um, both because our focus is on, um, is kind of thinking about education attainment, uh, we're going to focus on it, but also I'd say um, two reasons for, for why we don't look at health and outcomes at the child level is first, we don't have um, the full sample. We only have health data 
for kids who were at home. And you know, one would worry that that's uh, a selected sample. The second is once we look at the data, we find the most health spending in the sample is actually curative. It's not preventive. Um, so, the, so that seems less a margin um, to do it, but mainly we, we don't have a full sample of, for health. Um, okay. So I've shown you that um, we see this rise in educational expenditures on average, which seems to be concentrated in households that had at least one seven to 17 year old kid at baseline. Now, how did these liquidity shocks or how did the grace period increase educational investment? There are obviously two possibilities. One is that those that two months of grace period or that income effect associated with that was enough to change parental education decisions and that had effects over time. The second is that actually what everyone did was they first invested in their business investments. That's consistent with the fact that in 2007 and eight, we see no changes in uh, education expenditure and control versus treatment. And then th this additional wealth is what was used for um, education investments. So I think there are three pieces of evidence that support it. So first recall that what we varied was not whether um, you got microfinance. So this was not a entry of microfinance intervention. What varied was whether or not uh, it was delayed by two months. So everyone got their liquidity release. I mentioned this earlier as well, self-reports in 2008 on loan use show that on average only 3% of the loan was used for educational investment and this doesn't differ across treatment control. And then finally, um, which, um, when we look at this um, heterogeneity in gains of income, we find that we see in 2010 and continuing on that treatment household, the treatment households with kids with school going um, children also report gains in income. So this is not something that is concentrated only in those who didn't have uh, kids to invest in. So overall, our sense is that um, you know households got richer and that was used uh, for education, a fact that we'll return to again. So let me turn now to uh, child level results. Uh, let me ask Marco before, in case there are any before, questions right now. Yeah, uh, so Mandu, Mandulika is asking which component of education expenditures increase the most? Is it private tuition? I'm going to come to that. So that's exactly what we're going to look at now. Okay, and then uh, Kiko has a question on why, why does the educational expenditure decreases for the youngest? Is, it there, is there another cost, more public schools? Um, so I think it's very noisy when you look at the under uh, six sample. The other, th other thing which um, these effects are not significant, but the treatment households were slightly younger on average. So their kids are slightly younger. So they haven't actually got to that age of secondary schooling where the big expenses happen. So I think it's 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 a it's a function a little bit of um, you know they they're slightly younger and they're spending slightly less. But as I said, those there are very large standard errors on it. But um, we think that's the main reason why we're seeing these slight declines uh, in education expenditure, treatment uh, effects in education expenditure for households that have kids under six. Okay, and then Alessandro is asking whether you have data on expected returns to schooling. So this is something I'm going to come to. I think this is going to be one of the big questions that we're going to be interested in is that when we see these differences in, in investments, um, especially by high and low education parents, how much of that is perceptions or information, how much of it is actual returns. Um, so let me defer that for when we come to it. Perfect. Okay, great. So let me now start to turn to, we're going to look at three aspects of child level, in, uh, uh, um, child level effects. As I said, our results are, our data here comes from a full child outcome survey that we conducted in 2018 survey. So this was a full child roster. And the clients, the, the, the questions were asked to the client, but each client was asked for each child about the full education history, including spending. Um, so, we are, so we're going to, uh, look at these results right now. I'm going to first show you the results for the main child sample, that's a seven to 17, and then show you the placebo sample at the end. Um, as I said, there were two heterogeneities that we had pre-specified. So one is child gender, and the other is what we're going to define as high education parents, who are those who have at least some secondary uh, school, which in this case is class five or higher. And it turns out that this actually ends up being a relatively large part of the sample. So 85% of our sample has someone who has uh, got at least class five or higher education. 
So we're now coming to this question of where do we see the education spending? So the first column shows you an investment index, which is really just averaging four uh, z-scores of four components. So that's just to make sure that we, you know, uh, we see effects. We're not kind of focusing in on one particular effect. So you can see on average, um, there's a 0.25 standard deviation rise in investment. And then in columns two to five, we look at the components of where it's coming from. And so when you look at it, you can see that it's predominantly coming from a secondary school um, impact. So we see that you increase the amount you uh, spend on, uh, on, on, on secondary school fees. A very important part is you basically increase by a quarter the amount you spend on total after school tutoring. So that really seems to be the main, if you want additional investment that's going on is after school uh, private tutoring. And then um, kind of consistent with the fact that I'll show you on the next slide that you're more likely to go to college, college spending rises as well. So this is so the first thing we therefore see at the child level is a significant increase in education spending. And a lot of this is driven by more spending on private school, uh, after school tutoring. We then turn to see what happened to college enrollment. Um, so again, we construct an attainment index and we have four components to it, uh, whether you completed grade 10, so you find some increase there. Um, you don't find a lot of effect on if you want um, declines and dropout between 10th to 12th, it's a noisy estimate. But the really big effect is a decline in the dropout between uh, completing grade 12 and attending college. So what you can see is that on a base of, uh, in the control group, 27, 28% going to uh, college, we increase that by nine percentage points. And just to give you a point of comparison, uh, Esther Pascaline and Michael Kramer have a recent paper where they track uh, students in Ghana who they gave secondary school scholarships to. And when they did that, they found that basically those scholarships increased college attendance by four percentage points on a base of 15. So that was a 26% increase. For our population, we see a 33% increase. And then the last thing, and, and sorry, so, so and then you might, this comes again to this question of, did it matter where you were in that sample of kids? So what you see here on the left-hand side, this is just plotting out the entire distribution of kids, age seven and above, so a full child sample. And it's looking at the investment index um, estimates year by year. And what you can see, there's a clear rise in the investment in the treatment group, in the seven to 17 group. Uh, when you look at college enrollment, you see a rise, but as you can see here, the confidence intervals are overlapping. And that's where we're going to come a bit later to showing that these effects actually of the college enrollment are really driven by higher educated parents. And then finally, when you look at test performance, so we have three measures, whether the child got a grade A in class 10, a grade A in class 12, and then whether after class 10, they chose to go into the science track, which is typically an option available if you perform better in class 10. And on average, we don't see any effects on performance. So we don't see that this intervention changed that much in quality, but it changed whether or not you stayed on for college. And this is just showing you the indices for the placebo group. So this is kids over the age of 18, and both on the indices and then on individual components, we don't see any impacts. Do these effects uh, vary by child gender? Um, and the answer is no. So this might seem surprising to some because uh, I think we often read about uh, differences in labor market uh, uh, opportunities for men and women in India and their work. But in general, it is the case that um, there's quite a lot of literature showing um, the closing of the gender gap, at least in urban India for secondary and college education. And the general view is that education returns for women seem to be realized in the marriage market. So we see some noisy point estimates, negative point estimates on the performance index, but otherwise on average, we see no gender effects. So Rohini, here are there a couple of relevant questions. Yeah. Um, Viola asked, is asking about the heterogeneity based on the first or second child or the number of children in the household. Yeah, so um, right now what we're doing, um, at least on, um, uh, this is a child level regression. So we, we include birth order of the child. Uh, 
And you might actually expect the birth order, it's not obvious which way it go. And in general, you know, I've done work on this with Seema, others have noted the fact that um, kind of later birth order kids get less. But as you saw from the exposure graph, later birth order kids are also going to be exposed for longer. So um, ex ante, um, that's some <coughs> ambiguous. Um, you know, we've tried to keep our hands somewhat tied right now, but the one thing uh, that actually we were talking about just before this would be interesting to do is, you know, look at effects um, within households if we have enough sample. Uh, if you have two kids in the 7 to 17, so we can certainly try to look there at birth order effects more. But right now we're just controlling for it. And, and related to this heterogeneity by gender, Alessandro is asking whether you had effects, have you looked at effects uh, as uh, for marriage and, and childbearing for these kids? Yeah. Are, so, are they only not? I'm not sure. So, so, so some of them are old enough. They're noisy right now, but what we do see is delays in age of uh, marriage. And we actually see some evidence of increased self-employment among women who are living at home. So the two effects that we see are, this, the, I mean, again, our sample is not huge right now, but what we see is that women are more likely, daughters are more likely to be living at home, which basically means they're not married. Um, and they're somewhat more likely than to be self to be employed in the household enterprise. So um, I think that's consistent with the general literature that, you know, gains in education for girls associated with delays in age of marriage, and that's what we see as well. Mm -hmm. and, and the final question is from Matteo Boba. Uh, he, it, it seems like um, the tutoring is, is extremely important, but, but I'm not sure if, it, if there's a typo, but the, the expenditures in tutoring seem to be an order of magnitude higher than even college expenditures, no? Um, yeah, I mean, college is public, right? So, I mean, ah, okay. um, most people in college are going to public colleges. Um, so, I think that's one important reason for that. Okay. Yeah, that, that's all we have for now. Okay, great. Um, so, coming to this question, in fact, just building on uh, Matteo's question, uh, private schooling and after-school tutoring, just if you look at the control sample, they are positively correlated with college attendance and better educational gains. Um, these gains in college attendance are concentrated among those who had the most exposure to these private sectors. So they're just correlations from the control sample to help make you sense of the patterns we see. Um, but you know, we, we, we recognize, acknowledge the fact that secondary school investment is also likely to have returns outside of college. I think English skills are an important one in this setting. So the next thing we now look at is a heterogeneity by parental education, which as we said, we've kind of um, said we'd look at. And here what we see which is striking is that the effects are really concentrated among these higher educational parents. So if you had a parent who had at least one year of secondary schooling education, you are the child who benefits from the grace period. And if anything, you see some mild declines in investment among kids of um, low education parents. And so now if I redo these graphs that I showed you earlier of the investment index and the college enrollment, uh, restricting it to the higher educational parents, you can now see for college enrollment, a clear separation across the treatment and control groups, showing that this is really this higher educational groups that are the ones that benefit in terms of college enrollment. So why do we think these higher education households increased investments in schooling? So here's, you know, one, I think this is just suggestive, what we have in our baseline data in 2007 is some asset information. So we can use that to, we don't have income information, we have some asset information. So we can use that to create a socioeconomic index for households on baseline. And when we graph the treatment effects for college by the baseline uh, socioeconomic index, you see that the treatment effects are concentrated in the middle. And this kind of sort of, if you want S shape, so you, you can see for the blue line is the control group that very much looks like an S shape, which is then getting released as you have um, access to the grace period. And so this, I think for us is very reminiscent of the kind of poverty trap conversations that people have of saying that, there, that you know, if you are, if you're too poor, then maybe you need a very large increase or it's not, you're not on the margin of being moved by this, but for this middle group, you can see that they get moved. And if you're rich enough, then you are already investing in college and we see no changes there. We should also say that I'm not going to have time to talk about it, but we don't see any effects of treatment on migration, on female empowerment or on mental health. 
uh, for higher education households. So those don't seem to be channels of difference. Now coming a little bit to, I think this was implicit in the question that Alessandro had asked as well, you know, why is it that these lower education households don't increase investments in schooling? So it's not the case that they didn't see income gains. If anything, this is just showing you um, the graph, uh, the treatment graph for these low education households, which have at least one child in the relevant sample. You can see that the education gain, the income gains here are actually large. Now, going back to the uh, literature review I talked about in the beginning, where there was a disc where we talked about how the quasi-experimental literature has identified this trade-off between um, you know, gains from income that you can use for edu education versus productivity gains, it does seem that there is some trade-off between business and education investments, at least by just looking at that graph. Unfortunately, what we don't have is we didn't ask um, parents um, their perceptions on returns to education. So we can't fully rule out this alternative that um, what varies is perceived returns in education between low and high education. But I think we're going to do a little bit more work to see uh, what's going on here. But it is certainly what is this is consistent with is three or four years after you got the loan and started seeing these returns, low and high education parents began making very different choices on how to invest um, their resources, whether to continue investing in business or to invest in education. And one thing that I'll come back to uh, towards the end, but let me say in case I run out of time, I think this is important in telling us what you need to do to actually measure long run effects of treatment in these settings. So you can see very much that if um, some parents are investing in kids rather than in their business, you could possibly see kind of treatment effects disappear over time if you only focus on uh, business income or household income of the adults at the time you got, they got the investment. And so I think it's important to um, recognize that when you look at long run effects, you're going to have to start accumulating up returns to kids as well. And that's something I'm going to turn to uh, later. Uh, and so in fact, let me now turn to that. And what we're going to do right now, and you know, it would be you know, great to get suggestions from this audience as well, is we're going to focus on, if you want, three different ways of looking at um, uh, cost benefit analysis or welfare. None of these are, I'd say, uh, perfect. In some ways you won't actually bring them together, but in the literature right now, these have tended to sit, stand separately and that's going to be a little bit how we approach this as well. So what are the three things we're going to do? So the first, which is sort of the classic way uh, experimental evaluations of these kind of adult um, targeted programs that, that target um, businesses tend to do, is what you do is you compute a benefit cost ratio based on the program costs versus the gains in household income. So when we think about um, our, our um, study, uh, we're going to benchmark the estimates we see against the ultra poor program in Bangladesh that um, was studied. Um, it's, there's a, the negative of it is that that was in a rural area, this was in an urban area, but the positive is that West Bengal and Bangladesh have relatively similar features uh, kind of culturally and institutionally. So that's one way you could do it, which is just to kind of ignore gains for the kids and just focus on household outcomes. And I'd say that's the most traditional way you see um, these cost benefit analysis being done for say ultra poor programs um, in the literature. Now, the second way you could do it, which is really how people have been thinking about evaluating the returns to social programs targeting early childhood activities. So uh, the paper by Nathaniel Hendren and Ben Spranger, for instance, does it for across 50 uh, programs in, uh, in, in the US. Um, the deworming papers tend to do this analysis as well, which is what you look at is children. And you say, what's the child's lifetime earnings metric, earnings? And so you basically ask, you know, how much is the increase in the child's lifetime earning relative to the cost of the program upfront? Now, ideally, obviously, what we want to do is we want to combine these. So we want to combine the returns that we see in number one, which is the adult household, with those child lifetime earnings in the second. But right now, I'm going to show you separately and love to hear from you if you know of any papers that have tried to combine them. 
The third thing we're going to do, because we think it's sort of a useful exercise, is to follow a recent paper of Asher et al. and actually look at what happened to intergenerational education mobility. So, so we know overall across this period, we certainly see gains in education. I showed you average increases in treatment relative to control. But you know what happened to, um, if you want, the parent-child rank in the educational distribution? So does the child's education rank in the treatment group on average exceed that of the parent? So I'll turn to these three calculations in, I think, the last 10 minutes that I have. So let's start with the income gains. So as I said, the comparison group I want to use here is the ultra poor uh, comparison group. And really, I think you, you'll see in the first line where the main difference is going to come from is really on the cost side. And so this comes back to this question of, you know, um, the costs if you, of, of a loan program versus um, a grants-based program. So grants-based program, um, the average cost was over $1,000. For us, because the grace period didn't actually vary whether or not you got a loan, it actually just varied um, the first terms. And then the loan officers went for exactly the same number of times to the treatment and the control group. The, uh, the only additional cost we have for the grace period is additional default. And so we take the additional default numbers that we saw in our earlier paper, and that's basically $12. So you can see it's like a hundred times cheaper than the ultra poor program, just simply because um, it's a it's a lending program. So turning to the income gains, so in the ultra poor program, um, they have income over uh, gains for four years, and then they they kind of compute the lifetime discounted value of that, and end up with the income gains of roughly 43, 4400. We we assume that we see income gains for 11 years, and then to be conservative, since we see them become very noisy by the end of the period, we assume they go to zero after that. So we're basically going to assume that after a 2018 survey, those income gains disappear. So they linearly grew between 2008 and 18 and then disappeared. And so when you do that, you know, um, the gray period looks better on income, but really the main difference I would say here is coming from just the fact it's a very cheap program. And so what you can see is that the, you know, the internal rate of return or the benefit cost ratio is huge just because it's, you know, it has no additional cost beyond the default. Now, the second one um, comparison you can do is, as I said, this child welfare exercise. So here what we do is, so this is data from the IHDS sample in India. So this is a panel survey with two rounds in 2004 and 2012. What we plot here over time is for the sample we see, the annual earnings, um, the blue dots are for those who don't go to college and the red dots are for those who go to college in the sample. And what you can see is that basically, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a kind of pivot. So it's a, there's a linear increase after the age of say 22 uh, and that sort of grows over time. So we're going to be making our um, estimates, what we're going to do is we're going to assume that kids work from 18 to 59 and that the college going children do not work for the first three years. So they start working at 21 and consistent with the literature, um, we're going to use a social discount rate of 5%. And so again, when you do this, this just shows you the graph of what we see. The orange line is our uh, grace period estimates. The blue line is the control. Um, you, see, you see an internal rate of return is 26% here and a benefit cost ratio of 130. I think I talked to a lot about you know, how our intervention was cheap, but of course it's not the cheapest intervention out there. We know that deworming was super cheap. So unsurprisingly, you know, our internal rate of return at 26% is less than the, the deworming long run um, uh, internal rate of return of 36%. But both of these, you know, um, are much higher than say a traditional conditional cash transfer program. So uh, if you look at the long run study of the opportunity artist paper, that's 2.8 uh, against 130 for us. So as I said that, you know, right now we're keeping these separate. Ideally you'd want to bring them together, but let me now turn to the last one and then um, offer some concluding remarks. There should be on time. So, what we want to do is we want to have a measure that's going to distinguish relative mobility from the aggregate gains in educational level. So we're going to follow Asher et al. 
And what we're going to do is follow them in using what they use as a bottom half mobility measure. We think this makes a lot of sense in the context of a developing economy where you have a lot of, if you want, individuals who are really bottom coded, you know, a lot of people who are illiterate or have very little education. So you're going to ask what's the expected rank of a child who's born to someone in the bottom half of the educational distribution. So unlike uh, Asher told, we do have um, we do have small education bins. They had basically they saw like most people, 50% of the South in India was bottom coded. We can see a distribution there for parents as well. But we have a small sample size. And so we don't want to do sort of a Chetty style exercise of looking at you know, point by point. And therefore, we're going to focus on this bottom half. So, you know, you saw this already in the results that the increases in college education all occurred among households where the parents had at least secondary schooling. And so unsurprisingly, when we compute this uh, rank measure, what we see is in the treatment period, our relative mobility is lower compared to the control. So just to, just to, just to remind you, think about this way. So if you take the bottom 50%, and if um, child's outcomes were independent of parents' outcomes, and there was no mobility, then the average rank should be 0 0.25. So this is a case where there is some mobility, but what you can see is this relative mobility is slightly lower just in terms of rank, so not in terms of actual educational attainment for the grace period. And this is because for the grace period group, we see this difference in behavior among high education, low education periods. And so again, so I think this comes to this point that you know it's not, even though this intervention may look cheap, it's clearly not one that may be the right one for low education parents who, if they are given uh, business grants, have alternative, uh, relatively high return uses for them. So let me talk, uh, conclude with just some uh, final remarks. I think, you know, I think the most um, striking thing that, you, that we take away from our results is that it was a relatively small liquidity shock. So we gave a liquidity shock um, by, uh, by, two, uh, by uh, kind of a grace period of two months. This grace period in two months led to persistent gains in income. Um, the first thing that we can see is that, that on average, if when parents see these gains in income, they do invest in their children. So on average, um, you see these gains. I think a very reasonable question to ask at this point would be, you know, how much does context matter? So in terms of thinking about context, these are parents who had active businesses. They had come to the MFI looking for loans. This is a setting where primary education is already close to universal. And so what the income gains are doing is they're letting you invest in really private, uh, private tutoring, which is helping you get into college. And this is an urban setting where you actually have access. So the supply of private tutoring or the supply of secondary schooling is present, all of which maybe look very different in rural areas. But I think the, the, the thing to me that right now, I think you think about is, you know, the plus side of this is you can see a small liquidity shock targeted at this group of kind of micro entrepreneurs in, in normal times would have reasonably good returns, reasonably high returns. But right now we are not in normal times. And if you look in this very same setting right now, uh, this group is seeing pretty adverse liquidity shocks. I mean, both the MFI institution is seeing, uh, seeing liquidity dry up and that's getting translated down to the uh, parents. So I think if you flip this on the other side, it actually suggests that there's a, there's a reasonable reason to believe that you're going to see longer term consequences when it comes to secondary and college education that will go beyond the fact that secondary schools are shut or college is shut is because for this group, small, um, you know, if you, if you think about the S-shaped curve we showed you, for, the, for that group in the middle, you can get pushed quite a long way down from those shocks. So uh, let me stop here and uh, open up for questions. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much. And uh, to all attendees, please raise your hands see if you have any, any questions. And while people are uh, raising their hands, let me pass a couple of questions that were left hanging. So there's two questions that I, I think are, are related. One is from Marla, and she's asking whether uh, you see any, any effects on, on attainment, school attainment uh, between rich and poor. So the average effect, I think, is, uh, is zero, right? But are, are there... Um, heterogeneous effects by higher income or higher education parents. Uh, 
And Sorry, for, for what, for primary school or? Yeah, for school attainment. Oh, so yeah, okay, so yeah, so, so, so now we don't really see it, but we haven't cut it that much to look at it, um, you know, by, so we've just looked at average uh, school attainment, but we can do that exercise, we haven't done that yet. Okay, and, and then Alessandro is asking uh, that even though you do not have direct questions on returns to education, could you perhaps estimate the returns to education for control and treatment? This could be biased, but it would be interesting to show, uh, and you should observe that there was an increase in reduced, uh, in reduced form returns to education among similar households. Uh, yeah, this is a little bit more, more of a, a suggestion, I guess. Um, uh, thanks, that's useful. I think, I think, I think, I mean, we keep hoping that we're going to go back in the next round, have, you know, uh, data to do that, but we certainly, for older children, we do have, you know, someone who was 12 at the time of baseline has now probably entered the labor market, so we can probably look at the first couple of years to look at that. Okay, and, and finally, there's uh, an additional uh, comment from, from Mateo. Uh, so he says that the, the returns and the IRs, RRs that you find are huge. Uh, so these are, these are huge unconditional returns to experience among college graduates and much lower among high school graduates. Can you put these estimates in some perspective? Do they vary by sector, by some individual characteristics? So, yeah, so we're looking at just, as you said, college versus non-college. I mean, I think um, we can certainly do um, something to look at, like conditioning by occupation. But I think in general, it is the case that a number of people have, return, have written that returns to education increase a lot um, for higher secondary and college education. Um, I should also say I have like two of my co-authors here now, Patrick and Natalia, so they should both feel free to jump in also. Um, they have something to add. Okay, uh, we have a, a question for from Murugesha. Uh, so you're now allowed to talk. Hello, I'm adding just to this. But uh, is it possible to the recovery of labor market in upcoming years is positive or negative according to your studies? Okay. So can you, yes, yes can, can you come back with, with the question that I did, I don't think we heard you properly, especially the start of the question. No, no, just one the simple question I'm making here. The whether labor market is in, in upcoming years as a COVID impact, whether it's going to be recovery or it may be take some uh, several years to uh, go for potential uh, of labor market. Just some query. Yeah, so Jamarco, maybe yeah, I don't, it's it's not clear that the strategy. As far as I understand the question, I don't think it's what Rain is talking about today. Um, so we might want to move on. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thanks for the question. Uh, let, 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 let's try to keep the questions related to uh, to the paper that was uh, just presented. Um, I don't know if there are any additional so questions. Let me let me just ask a question, uh, Rainy. Uh, I was like, you know, while you were talking, and um, I sort of tried to keep track of a bunch of different things, but I was trying to figure out whether you you like us to think about uh, the intervention as the grace period intervention or as an income elasticity. Um, so, do. You, which way do you think actually we should think about the, the intervention? So, you know, the, the proper intervention is actually a grace period, but, you know, should we interpret this as income elasticities of uh, education um, or more like, you know, there's a grace period and there are other things that happen together with uh, the income effects? So I think the way we interpret it, especially when we look at, say, the educational effects in the very short run where we don't see any, is that you know, it was two steps that the grace period influenced your business investment decisions, which led to income gains. And then having those income gains, uh, there was a choice to invest it in, uh, in education. Uh, one thing I'd say is that if you look at, if you ask what share of the overall income gains uh, uh, went to educate, like what, like, sorry, 
uh, worst share of total income gains is made up by the education expenditure. It's around 12%. So roughly 12% of the total income gains from the experiment were spent by treatment households on education. Would, would you feel comfortable doing that that, that elasticity calculation? Uh, then it's, it's, you know, it's just... It's just yeah, we should, we should do it. I mean, I think, you know, everything has caveats on it, but I think it would probably be uh, something that we should do. Okay, cool. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for the comment. Great. So now there's another question from Arturo Aguilar. Arturo, now you should have muted yourself. Hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hi, Rohini. Hi, um, so uh, I guess uh, my question was around uh, the, the additional things that might happen in the environments where uh, these children were growing up. So do you have uh, any information about, uh, for instance, if, if parents were better able to, be, to build businesses, were expectations about their children's different? Did they kept uh, borrowing money more often? Do they grow in a different uh, environment, I guess? Um, so do you have any uh, anything to say about? So we unfortunately don't have much on belief. So again, I think, I think it's a perfectly reasonable uh, possibility that as you get richer, what this income elasticity, if you want, captures is potentially uh, ability to uh, changes your perceptions of the of, of income. I think the so I, we don't have anything perception. I think the one thing we've looked a bit at, we haven't seen much, but we could look a bit more at that neighborhood. So as I said, you know, uh, what was randomized uh, into a treatment was a group of, you know, five women uh, who typically live close to each other. And so we could try to see if that had, you know, if there were any really a neighborhood level variation, if you want, or even returns to businesses taking place in a treatment cluster versus a control cluster. But I don't know how much uh, ability we'll have to see that now, but we can try to look a bit at that. Okay, thanks. Okay, and uh, we have a, an additional question from uh, Viola Asri. Uh, she's saying that uh, she thinks that the ultra poor program and the grace period interventions are fundamentally different in the type of liquidity shocks that they provide. Um, so uh, she was wondering whether you, you wanted to comment on, on this. Um, Completely. I mean, I think I think they're very different, and you know, they're very different contexts. I think this comes a little bit to Giacomo's question of what do we think is the channel? Channel. I think what the channel we're thinking that's common to the two is really that they both increased income, and so then you know the question is if you if you basically have programs that increase income, uh, whether those that translate into educational outcomes, uh, both what the elasticity and what the cost is. So um, I think, as I said, it. it the population is sufficiently different that you could say that to increase the income of ultra poor households, you need heavy handed asset transfer programs with skills training. You can't do it by just, uh, you know, just changing it a little bit. But I think the reason why the comparison is relevant is sort of the second stage, which is to say how do we do But This is not to say that in, in a rural village in Bangladesh, this would, what we did would succeed to raise income. Great. Uh, I think there are... Yeah, I, have, I have a related question. Oh, well, I <laughs> so, the, so it's going back to the heterogeneity on, on education, which is, of course, related. And so can you tell us a bit more on, also from the earlier work, I guess, on, on what is, is heterogeneity in education on some of the other outcomes part of the mechanism, like either on income, but even on other things you may have. Good question. I don't think we've looked at it to see, I mean, in that version, we were very interested in sort of risk related measures, because that's what we thought it is. So we didn't look so much by education. I don't know, Patrick, if there was anything we did, but I think it's, it's a good question to see whether they were more likely to do business investments or less. I mean, we looked at high and low income. I think to the extent high education is linked to possibly, you know, being um, also higher assets, to start with the higher income, I would suspect what we would see is the, you know, they did similar business investments, but they started diversifying into education earlier. Awesome. And you know, if they were if they were too rich, if you want, then they're just not affected on the education margin by our intervention. Okay, so there's an additional question. Uh, so Seung Yung. <laughs> 
Hi, um, thank you so much for the talk. I just had a quick question about, I guess, the, the persistence of income gain. So if, if this two month grace period um, had positive income gains for uh, the households in the treatment group, did, if they, like, I think, I remember seeing a graph, it was like diverging and then kind of converging with noisiness data. Um, when they do diverge, could you comment a little bit about how maybe households could, if you have a household enterprise, then maybe they could have differing um, opinion, differing, uh, sorry, differing preferences on what to do. So like, it's not that necessarily that it's a decision between whether to invest in your children's education versus spending more on your business, but it could be that like the time, there could be more of like a time lag for certain sectors, maybe like if you need to invest in certain assets versus um, you, the income gains can go straight into the children's education. I think that's what we were saying, that I think our sense is the way this worked is exactly that the grace period helped change business investments. In the short run, you know, the average household says that it's only 3% of their loan they were using directly for education. Um, so it's, it seems to us that it was some amount of increasing income that then allowed you to um, di change, diversify your investments. And if you were a relatively low education household, you continue to invest in your business, not in education. Okay, great. So ah, there's uh, one last question from, no, I, I think that the hand was raised by, by mistake. Anyways, this is a perfect time to, to wrap up the seminars. Thank you so much, uh, Rohinian, to everyone who attended. And we'll be back in a, in a couple of weeks with, uh, on November 10th, uh, and we'll have Jakob Svensson from Stockholm University. And Giacomo has written down the Zoom link. Rohini will be available, will be available there for another 15 minutes in case uh, someone wants to discuss uh, further with her. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you everyone for attending. Bye. Thanks, Rohini. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Bye.